Thank God bless you. you. May be seated. Beautiful day, and it's a day that we get to remember what the, our Savior has done for us. And we're going to have a time of communion, a time of uh, just fellowship together as uh, we remember the Lord's suffering. We're going to go to Isaiah 53, and we'll be here in just a moment. But uh, thank you for being here. It's good to have Vincent back, uh, finish up all of his training. Uh, in, where did you start? You started in? Uh, started up in Great Lakes for boot camp. Right. Went to, uh, Pensacola. Yeah, he went to Pensacola, Florida. And now he has to really suffer for the Lord. They're sending you to? Hawaii. Hawaii. <laughs> Hey, you know, for some people, you know when you used to watch the ads about join the military, see the world, and they used to make it look glamorous and wonderful, and for most people it was not glamorous and wonderful. For this guy, it actually worked out. He went to Pensacola, and then from Pensacola, you know, he's getting sent to uh, Hawaii. So, uh, and it's going to be an extended stay there, right? So, my wife and I are already planning to come and see you. Just, just saying. So just saying, we're, yeah, we will be there. Uh, you, so just, I, I'm looking forward to that, come and hang out with you, really. So, uh, you know, it's, it's the pastoral duty to go check up on your church members, make sure they're doing okay, to go encourage them in the Lord. You know, so uh, I feel like it's just my, my responsibility. Somebody needs to take one for the team, amen? For Team Jesus, we're going to Hawaii, amen. <laughs> So, uh, but it's so good to have you enjoy the time with your family. I think you're getting some family pictures right after church today. So it's just uh, good to see him and glad he's doing well. And God bless you. And we will see you in Hawaii real soon. So uh, anyway, God bless you guys. We're going to go to Isaiah 53 and uh, kind of a familiar passage. We're going to just, just be here for a few moments, a few minutes, and then we'll go to, uh, a little bit later, we'll go into the passage where we kind of uh, go through the uh, Lord's Supper and communion. And we really do try to make this a, a special time, important time at our church. And you know, I know some churches, and I'm, it's fine, but I know some churches will literally just do four or five minutes of the Lord's Supper real quick, and then they go on and do everything else. But I really feel like this is something that is important that we need to do. So we'd like to go ahead and do that today. So in Isaiah 53, it says this. It says, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Uh, notice uh, verse number two. It says, for he, speaking of Christ, for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. And then verse uh, number three, uh, it says, um, he was despised and he was rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, notice this, from one whom men hid their faces, it notice it says this, and he was despised and we esteemed him not. I want to just stop for a moment before we continue reading because these first few verses really, really just hit me. You know, sometimes people say, what did Jesus look like? What did Jesus look like? Well, first of all, Jesus was Jewish, okay? You know, I've seen there's like the black Jesus, there's the white Jesus. You know, all the movies portray Jesus with this like flowing straight hair. Um, and it, it, let me just emphasize, Jesus was born a Jew. He was a Jewish man. But let me go one step farther. Uh, I don't know if we could do it, but back in verse number two, I want you to notice, it tells us a little bit about what he looked like. It says, he grew up like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. But notice this, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him. And notice this, and no beauty that we should desire him. The Bible tells us that Jesus was not an attractive man. He was not beautiful. He wasn't handsome. In essence, he was, I'm not going to say he was ugly because God doesn't create anything that's ugly, but he was an average, just an average man. You know, I think sometimes we don't really think about this, but when, when God sent his son, Jesus Christ was the essence of humility. He came, the Bible says that he had no majesty. That, that there was no beauty that any should desire him. You know, in the scripture, the Bible talks about those, there were those who were attractive. Were, the Bible says that, that Joseph, Joseph was a very good looking man. I don't, you know, I don't know, just something about that name. But the Bible says Joseph was a very attractive man. 
Just saying. Um, the Bible says that David, any Davids in here? Uh, that David, remember David was a very, uh, the Bible says he was good looking. He was very attractive. Um, the Bible mentions Solomon. There's another one, um, Solomon's son. Absalom, the Bible says it was also, you know, is, you know, there's something about David and his lineage and his family. They were very attractive and they were very handsome. The Bible even, even makes reference to the fact that they were very goodly to look at. They were very handsome. They were good looking. But you know what's interesting is when the Bible speaks about Christ, the Bible says that he was not, he was not, can I put it in these terms? He wasn't handsome. Jesus was not handsome. Jesus was not someone, in fact, the Bible says he, there was nothing beautiful about him on the outside. He was just average. The humility of Jesus Christ. Just an average looking man. Nothing majestic about him. No beauty. In fact, the Bible says no beauty that we should even desire him. And then the next verse says, verse 3, we read it, but it says this, that he was despised, rejected. Notice this, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. But notice this, one from whom men hid their faces. It says again, he was despised and there was no esteem for him. You know, this is, I mean, we really think about this. He was not one that, ever, the Bible says they hid their faces from him. He's kind of the one that many a people, if they, they say, well, I don't want anyone to see that I'm associated with Jesus. Let's go back for a moment in the Old Testament. How many of you are familiar with the tabernacle? Anyone remember the tabernacle in the Old Testament? You know what people may miss is that everything God did was intentional. The Bible says that when they... God told Moses to make this tabernacle, and they made the tabernacle. The tabernacle was, was going to be where God dwelt with man. And the Bible says in the New Testament, and the Bible says that when Jesus came, that he was Emmanuel, God with us, or God tabernacled with us. What's interesting about the tabernacle is, here's a picture of it, is the external tabernacle was covered in what was called badger skins. Badger skins are rough, they're plain, they're ordinary. There's nothing pretty about them. They're very plain. And so when people would look at this tabernacle, obviously the tabernacle is a tent. It was a temporary dwelling place. They would move it from place to place. And later the tabernacle was replaced by the temple. But I want you to understand that there's, this is intentional. I think there's something very beautiful, very beautiful picture. And that is this, is that when Moses was given instruction by God, God said to make and use badger skins, these very plain, very ordinary, rough uh, coverings to, to, to make this tabernacle. And the idea is this, is that when people looked at it, there was nothing special about it. There was nothing beautiful. There was nothing appealing. In fact, it was very plain. It was very ordinary. In fact, no one, none of the enemies of Israel, when they saw this, they would look at it and think that anything special was taking place there. Are you with me this morning? That there was nothing significant. But do you remember when Moses prayed? The Bible says that Moses prayed. And when he prayed and he dedicated this tabernacle to the Lord, the Bible says that the glory of God came and dwelt inside that tabernacle. And within the tabernacle, there was a place called the Holy of Holies. And there, there was the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant, we understand it was Moses' rod and the Ten Commandments. And there was the manna. But what happened was this, when Moses prayed, the glory of God came down in t into this tabernacle, and inside this tabernacle, this very plain, ordinary looking thing, the very glory of God dwelt there. Are you with me? From the outside, it looked plain. From the outside, it looked ordinary. From the outside, there was nothing appealing to it, and yet within it was the very presence of the living God. God. This tabernacle is a picture of Jesus Christ. That when Jesus Christ came, it was a foreshadowing of the coming of the Messiah. That when the Messiah would come, there would be nothing beautiful, nothing spectacular on the outside. But within him dwelt the very glory of God. He was God with us.
And Isaiah says that the Messiah is coming, that there is the suffering servant who will come. And when the suffering servant comes, there will be nothing beautiful about him on the outside. Boy, I think there's a great truth to this, and that is do not judge a book by its cover. So many times we look on the outside and we judge by appearance and we look on the outside and you want to know something? Jesus on the outside looked plain. He looked ordinary, but there was no one more special, no one more precious than the very son of the living God, Jesus Christ. And so inside this tabernacle dwelt the very presence of God. Let me just throw this out here as well. Paul says in the New Testament that as believers we are jars of clay. That our bodies are nothing but clay and there's nothing special or spectacular in essence of what we look like but as believers in Jesus Christ aren't you thankful that we have the spirit of God that comes and he says we have in these earthen vessels, in these jars of clay he says we have the precious Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Amen? And so it's not what's on the outside that matters. It's what's on the inside. And don't judge a book by its cover. Are you with me this morning? And yet we live in a society, in a world, in a culture that so oftentimes only looks at the outside and is only interested on what someone looks like on the outside. And when this culture in the days of Jesus, they looked at him and they said, there's nothing spectacular about him. He's plain. He's ordinary. But yet he was God with us. And so this precious man, Jesus, in Isaiah 53, will continue reading. It says this, he has borne our griefs, he has carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him. We esteemed him, stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. The Bible says people thought that he was getting what he deserved. But Jesus was not getting what he deserved because Isaiah goes on to say that he was getting what we deserved. But he was pierced. Crucifixion, he was pierced. For our transgressions. Jesus was put on the cross for your sin, for my sin. He was crushed for our, for my iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. He was put on the cross for us. He willingly went to the cross for us. Isaiah says. All we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned everyone to his own way or to his own path, the scripture says. But notice the Lord has laid on him, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. As we think about and as we read this passage and as we're getting ready to have communion, Lord's Supper, we must be be reminded and remember what Jesus Christ went through for us. That Jesus Christ willingly went to the cross and that his sin, he had no sin. The Bible says he who had no sin became sin for us. Our sin put Jesus Christ on the cross. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears it is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who is considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken, notice this, why was he stricken? For the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave. Notice the the prophecy here. They made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, he never sinned one time. Jesus went about doing good. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He never sinned. Yet he who knew no sin became sin for us. Our sin was placed upon Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, as we were looking back at that tabernacle, and as Moses was told to build the tabernacle, and yes, he he made it with the badger skins, which was plain and ordinary, a picture of Jesus Christ who was plain and ordinary, but on the inside, 
was beautiful. What we also realized is that there was where they would have a lamb and they would shed the blood and they would have uh, that, that time of year, every year where they would shed the blood of an innocent animal. There was also many times people don't understand this, but they would have two. They would have two spotless lambs that they would watch for days and make sure there's no blemish and no sickness. And they would take the one and they would pray over it and, and, and literally touch its head and pray over it and they would call it the scapegoat. Do you remember that? You ever heard of the term scapegoat? Then they would send it out into the wilderness. The idea of the sins being placed upon it and it's, it's taken away from the camp. But then they would also shed the blood. Do you understand? Jesus became our scapegoat for us. And he became the sacrifice for us. He is that sacrificial lamb. And as we come here today, we are remembering what Jesus Christ has done for us. We are not worthy. Jesus Christ was worthy. And because he is worthy, we understand that because he was perfect, our sin was placed upon him. The Bible tells us. He had no violence. There was no deceit in his mouth. But notice what the scripture says. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Do you know one version says it like this? Yet it pleased the Lord to crush him. He was put to grief. When a soul, notice his soul is made an offering for guilt, for my guilt. When a soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It was all a part of God's plan. Amen. And out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. I once heard it said like this. That as a high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, he would take the, the blood of that innocent animal and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. You see, that Ark of the Covenant required holiness. That Ark of the Covenant was covered in what was called the mercy seat. And yes, there's God's judgment and God's wrath for sin. But the high priest each year would go in and it would require a sacrifice. And every year as he would go into the Holy of Holies, the high priest would go in and sprinkle the blood upon that, 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 that mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. So that God would, would show mercy upon his people. And each year there was a time of atonement. On the day of atonement he would go in and make atonement for the people. And the people would stand outside and the priest would oftentimes, and they would have a rope and uh, tied around his, his ankle and he would have bells. And even one time the sons of, of Aaron, the high priest, were struck dead. And they had to pull them out of the holy of holies. And then the next priest in line had to go in. How would you like to be the next guy in line? But they would go in. in a, it's sacred. It was a holy place. As we sang earlier, it was holy ground. And as you would go in, I'd heard one pastor reference it like this, as if he was going into the presence of God. He would hear the sound of, of, the, of the, the Lord's crying out, sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. But one day, the day that Jesus Christ became our sacrificial lamb, the day that the Bible says that as Jesus was hung upon the cross and he cried out, it is finished. The Bible says from top to bottom, the veil in the temple was torn in two. We understand that he made a way, he made access for all men to come into the presence of a holy God. Amen. And on that day, as the priest walked in, I think this is beautiful. As the priest walked in and saw the veil torn, what he may have heard was something like this. Instead of sacrifice, he heard this, this phrase, satisfied, satisfied. Because listen, the atonement for sin was paid once and for all. Jesus Christ became the great high priest, the great sacrificial lamb. He paid the price and now our sin has been paid for and it has been satisfied in the presence of of a holy God. Who? Thank you, Jesus. And now when you and I sin, as we sin every day, 
the Lord no longer cries out. God no longer cries out. Sacrifice, he says, it's satisfied under the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we put on his cloak of righteousness. That when God sees us, he sees the satisfaction, the satisfied, finished work of Jesus Christ, what he did for us on the cross. He says it's satisfied. It's been paid in full. The sin debt has been paid. Amen? He says this, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. It's saying that Jesus will go through this suffering, but he will be exalted. He will be glorified. We know he is seated at the right hand of the Father. Because why? He poured out his soul to death. He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. He paid the price. Amen? And to all who call upon him and believe upon him, the Bible says that they're forgiven. It's satisfied. And so as we come together today and as we take a few moments and we remember Christ and remember what he has done for us, in the moment when we think about the bread and we think about the, the juice, we're remembering the the very body. The Bible says by his stripes we are healed. That it pleased the Lord to crush him. That it was all a part of God's purpose, God's plan. So that thousands of years later we can sit here and we can have this time of communion and fellowship to remember what Christ has done for us. And Jesus said, don't forget what I have done for you. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul says... He says, I've received the Lord that which also I have delivered to you. He says that the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and went and given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And then it says, after the same manner, he then also took the cup. And he said, this cup is the New Testament, my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. He goes on and he gives further instruction and then he tells us that we should not take it unworthily and that we should, of course, examine ourselves to know that we are a follower of Christ and to know that we are in, in communion and fellowship with him. We understand that Christ in the upper room, that he established this time. He established this time because he said, I want you to remember me. You know, I know this to be true, that obviously God created us, and he knows all about us, and he knows our humanity, and he knows that our human natures, that we get busy, and we, am I right? We get busy, and we get distracted, and life gets busy, and life gets crazy, and he said, you know what? You're going to get busy, and so what I want you to do is I want you, as followers of Christ, and even as the church, to take time aside to remember what I've done for you. To remember that suffering servant. To remember what Jesus Christ did for us. Because, you know, let's be honest. It's sad, but I think there's times we could go days without really reflecting and remembering what Christ has done for us. It's, but understand this. God knew us. He created us. And he said, I know what you people are like. You're going to get busy. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to establish an ordinance. Something I've, I'm going to command you to do to set time aside. Let's be honest. If, if someone didn't come up with the idea of a birthday, we probably would go years without celebrating it. Am I right? If we didn't have Father's Day, guys, we'd be in big trouble. That's just a fact. Right? And Mother's Day and Father's Day, someone said, hey, we need to set this time aside because if we don't, we'll go years without honoring someone. We'll go years without even reflecting upon them. You know, the Lord did the same thing. He said, I know your, your human nature is that you're just going to get in a hurry. You're going to get in a rush. You're going to get distracted and you're going you're gonna to get so busy that you're going to, even the church is going to forget what it's all about. Let me just pause for a moment and say this. Everything as a church, everything we do, it's about him. Everything we do is about him. 
as a follower of Jesus Christ, everything we do is about him. We are nothing without Christ. And so he says, I want you to set this time aside. Set time aside to remember what I have done for you. And so that's what we're going to do today. And so what I'd like to do is just really just take a few moments. I think it's a time where we examine ourselves. It's the time of confession. Where if there's sin in our life or things in our life that we know are hindering our fellowship and walk with God, that we take a few moments. The Bible says if we confess our sin, he, the great high priest, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. I think also, most importantly, I think it's a very important time to really a time of thankfulness. You know, as we think about the fact that we're coming into Thanksgiving, it is a time of being thankful and grateful. There are many things we could be thankful for, our health and the life that God has given us, our family. You know, when we think about Thanksgiving, thankful for answered prayer, thankful for miracles that God has performed this past year to be thankful for his provision. But most importantly, may we take this time to be thankful for God's son, Jesus Christ, the Emmanuel, God with us, the one who tabernacled with us, the one who came and walked in our shoes, the one who came and took our place, the one who became sin for us. Amen. The one who was our scapegoat, the one who was our sacrificial lamb, to take just a few moments just to take this time to remember and reflect in a time of thanksgiving, to just take a moment and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us. Everything that we've ever gone through, he has gone through and then some. He knew what it was like to be lonely. He knew what it was like to be laughed at and mocked, ridiculed, to be despised. He suffered. And so, you know, maybe even there's some things that you're going through in your life right now, some struggles, some difficulty, some trial. Understand this. Why did Jesus Christ have to come? You know, one time I was witnessing to a, a man, a Muslim man, and he said, why is it, he says, I don't understand it. Why is it that, that, that your Savior, why is it that your Savior, is, if he is truly the Son of God, why did he have to come to earth? And why did he have to do that? And the answer is simply this. Because he is the only Messiah, the only Savior, who's ever walked in our shoes. He, think about this, he... He walked in our shoes. He, he did it so that he could be compassionate. He did it so that when you cry out and you say, I feel alone, he says, I know how you feel. When you feel betrayed, he says, I know how you feel. When you feel, when you feel hungry, he says, I know how you feel. When you feel thirsty, I know how you feel. The Bible says he was hungry. He was thirsty. He was lonely. He was despised. When you feel sorrow and grief, the Bible says Jesus wept. When he went to his funeral of his, his friend Lazarus, the Bible says Jesus wept. So when you go through sorrow and grief, he says, I know exactly how you feel. So why did Jesus Christ, why did he have to leave heaven and come? So that he could be a great high priest, a compassionate high priest. He feels everything that we go through. And so whatever it is that you may be going through, whatever struggle, the Bible says, Jesus said, cast your care on me because I care for you. I do. I care about you. And so during this time of communion, I also believe it's a time where if there's struggles and difficulty, strongholds in your life or areas in your life where you say, I am strong with this. I need help. This is where you say, Lord, I give it to you. Lord, help me. And he will gladly take it. Amen. And so we're going to take just a few moments and we're going to have just a, a brief time of just kind of silent prayer and appreciation and thanksgiving and encourage you to just take a few moments and we'll then prepare and then we'll pray over the, the bread and we'll remember the body of Christ and we'll remember the blood that he shed for us. So let's just take a few moments and have some silent quiet time with, with the Lord this morning.
if you're able, would you be willing to stand with me as we have just a time of prayer? We're going to stand together and pray. And ask the Lord to bless this time of communion and fellowship with Him. Lord, we love you. Father God, we thank you for the precious gift of your Son. We thank you for this time that we can come together, Lord, to remember you and all that you've done for us. We're thankful, Lord, for the suffering servant, the man of sorrow. Lord, the man who the scripture says that there was nothing appealing. In his fleshly appearance, there was nothing beautiful that would draw anyone to him. But Lord, we are thankful that he was and is the most beautiful, precious Savior. The one in whom the glory of God dwelt. There was no greater love and nothing more precious than your son. Lord, help us, Lord, to not judge a book by its cover. The Bible says that they despised your son and they rejected him. Lord, help us to see the inner beauty, Lord, of your son. Lord, may we see the inner beauty, Lord, of one another. As the Bible says that as followers of Christ, that within us dwells the Spirit of God. That in these jars of clay, the Holy Spirit dwells. And so, Lord, I pray that, that Lord, you would just bless this time as we reflect and remember. We thank you. We praise you. We give you all honor and glory. Everything that we do, we do is for you, Lord. And may we be mindful and thankful for who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. We have two different stations, one in the back, one in the front, and also if you need help, I know Brother Eddie and some of the other men in the church would be willing to help get it to you. Um, and so we're going to just kind of give everyone an opportunity as they play and sing uh, to grab the elements, and then we'll have a time of prayer over each one in just a moment. Bible says that uh, when he had given thanks, speaking of the bread, he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Would you take just a moment and look at the bread? Remember the body of Christ? The Bible says that it pleased the Father to, to bruise him. By his stripes we are healed. Lord, we thank you for your body. We thank you for this.
bread, Lord, as we remember, Lord, your broken body, Lord, the pain and the suffering and the anguish that you went through, Lord, for us. We thank you today. Lord, we thank you for truly how much you loved us. No greater love than this than a man lay down his life for another. And so we thank you. We praise you. We give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible says, as they were in the upper room, after they had broken the bread, it says that afterwards he took the cup and he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you take just a moment and look at the juice and remember the blood of Christ? Lord, we thank you for your blood. Lord, the precious blood. Lord, the blood of Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you, Lord, that you were willing to shed your blood to sacrifice, Lord, the very essence of, of your life that you were willing, willingly laid your life down for us. The Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness for sin. And so Father we thank you Lord. For the gift of your son. Lord Jesus we thank you for your sacrifice for us. We praise you. We give you honor. We give you glory. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. The Bible then goes on to say that when they were in the upper room, when they were finished, it says that when they had sung a hymn, they went out. It's interesting because uh, the hymn or the psalm that they sang was in the book of Psalms. We're not singing that one today. But in the book of Psalms, whenever they would have Passover together, they would sing different psalms. And one of the psalms that they sang was the one that says this. I'll just give you one of the verses. It says, this is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, it really blows my mind because Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples. And he just finished telling them, I'm going to go. I'm going to suffer for you. I'm going to shed my blood and my body is going to be broken for you. And when he's finished telling them and pouring out his heart, pouring out his soul, and he's saying, I am going to go and I'm going to suffer. He, we know he later goes to the garden and he prays and he sweats great drops of blood. The weight of, of sin and the weight of the sin of the world is being placed upon him. And that great weight that he's carrying. And he knows that his father will betray him. All that he knows that he's going to go through, yet he has the ability to say this. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Brothers and sisters in Christ, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, no matter what we go through, no matter what struggles we're going through, no matter what sorrow may come into your life, you can truly say, this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's finish with one last hymn before we dismiss. May the Lord bless you and keep you. He loves you. If you ever doubt how much he loves you, remember the blood. Remember the body. Remember Isaiah 53. Amen. He was despised and rejected. Amen. He loves you. And if you were the only one, he would have done it just for you. You're that pearl of great price. He would have done it just for you. Wow. 
if that doesn't cause you to just be a little thankful and grateful and appreciative, if that doesn't make you want to leave here and just charge hell with a super soaker, let's go. <laughs> let's just take it on. Amen? Man, we are, we are so blessed. I love you. God bless you. And remember him this week. Amen? Amen.